Okay, so um, remember we're studying this function. This was the, the formula for the function. We found its derivative. That was our step four. And then we, uh, the last thing we did was draw this uh, little table here, which reveals how information we have on f prime uh, indicates facts about f. There are th these are theorems that are hidden here, right? These are actual theorems that we mentioned. And then we made a little temporary drawing um, of, of trying to express this information. Uh, it's not accurate yet because there are still steps that we need to do. So what? This was step five, I think. Yes. Step five. So let's continue with step six. Maybe I'll write it here. So step six is going to be um, extrema. Minimas and ma minima and maxima. So, actually, we already said this too. So, x equals zero is a minimum. Okay, why? The function is continuous there, right? It is continuous there. If it weren't continuous, things could, could happen differently, right? It could have, for example, an asymptote. That we still have to explore. But in this case, since it's continuous and it's decreasing and then increasing, it's going to be a minimum. And x equals 2 is a maximum, because the derivative is equal 0 there, increasing on one side and decreasing on the other. Do you agree? So we know that, so let's write that information. x equals 0 is a local minimum, and x equals 2 is a local maximum. Okay? And by the way, at this point, it, it, it's usually also good to have the actual y value that corresponds. So for x equal 2, you plug it into the function and you get uh, third root of 4. So that's the actual point. That's the value at this local maximum. Okay? Okay. So step 7, let's continue here. Step 7 is going to be the second derivative, uh, second derivative, and the second derivative you find by taking the derivative of the first derivative, okay? That first derivative, we had it here on the board, okay, and it's kind of a not a pretty sign. But, where's that taken from? Some movie? I don't remember. Okay, anyway, so this is the first derivative. You want to take its derivative. There's going to be a couple of chain rules and product rules, and it's going to have four terms in it, right? So there's a bit of work. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to le leave it to you to calculate it. It's not that tricky. But if you do it correctly, let's rephrase that. If I did it correctly, then what you should get is the following. Things actually cancel out pretty neatly. And you get minus 2 x to the minus 4 over 3 times 3 minus x to the power negative 5 over 3. And that's it. Everything else either cancels out or gets collected into this single expression. So please do the calculation. I skipped the actual calculation here. Okay? Now, of course it's not defined, so f prime prime is not defined at x equals 0 and x equals 3. That's obvious from here, but it's obvious to start with because f prime wasn't even defined there, so you can't take its derivative, right? Okay. And you can easily observe that f prime prime is positive for uh, x greater than 3, and f prime prime is negative for x non-zero less than 3. Okay, so it's the same sort of 
of calculations and arguments and solving equations or inequalities as you do in step four for the derivative itself. Okay, you have to do it again for the second derivative. Okay. And once you do it, we get to step eight. Step eight is again that table that we had before, but before we had the table for f prime, how it reflects information on f. Now we're going to have it for f prime prime. So what we find, there are only two significant points to mention here, 0 and 3. And f prime prime is positive when x is greater than 3 and negative whenever x is less than 3. And from the discussion earlier today, we know that what this means, what is this telling us about in terms of f? Right, convexity. So when f prime prime is negative, what does it mean about f? Concave. Okay, so uh, the way I'm going to draw it symbolically is like this. So in this region, f is concave. In this region, f is concave as well. And in this region, f is convex. Okay, it's just a symbolic drawing. Okay. And what about points of inflection? Let's call that step nine. Step nine, inflection, points. So step eight was convexity. And where do we have points of inflection whenever the function changes from being convex to being concave or vice versa? So there's only one of them, and it's at x equals 3. Okay? Inflection points, x equals 3. Good? And note that in this situation, this is the only inflection point, and at this point, it's not true that f prime prime um, is 0. F prime prime is not defined here. Okay, maybe I, I should add this. So at both this point, these points, 0 and 3, the second derivative does not exist. It's not 0, it just doesn't exist. Okay, this point is not anything significant in terms of the second derivative because it doesn't change convexity. This point is an inflection point, but it's not, uh, it doesn't satisfy F prime prime equals 0. Hmm? The function is continuous, yeah. But that doesn't mean it's an inflection point. Okay, we know. I mean, we had the, the temporary drawing here at zero. It's just a cusp. Okay? Okay, so that was step nine. Okay, we, we, I don't want to draw another temporary drawing throwing this information at that picture. We'll do that at the end. We'll have the final drawing. But there is another step that we have to do, and that step is asymptotes. Okay, so let's start off on a new board here. So step 10 um, asymptotes. Uh, there's a P there, right? Asymptotes. Did I spell it correctly? Okay. So there are two kinds of asymptotes. There are uh, vertical asymptotes. Okay. And then there are, well, you can separate them into horizontal asymptotes and just any linear asymptotes. We're going to throw them in as one. So... But we never defined this, so I'm actually going to throw in the definitions here, in the middle of the example. Okay? So, definition. Definition. X equals X zero. That's the formula for a vertical line. Is 
called a vertical asymptote a vertical asymptote if you tell me if it's a vertical asymptote so you should picture the function getting closer and closer and closer to it or right if the limit of f of x as x approaches this value x0 and from one side is enough so I'm gonna indicate that by putting a plus or a minus but I'm lazy so I'm gonna put plus minus but it's an or statement either from plus or from minus equals infinity or minus infinity okay so any of those four situations which I'm indicating in a maybe not a good way by putting pluses or minuses here is called a vertical asymptote clear okay so the, the picture you should have in mind um, the picture you should have in mind is some some vertical line where this is x0 and the function the function approaching it either from the right or from the left either going to minus infinity or maybe going to plus infinity give me some examples of functions right 1 over x has a vertical asymptote at 0 give me some more ln of x has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 right arctan of x has oh no arctan of x has a horizontal asymptote good clear okay so that's a vertical asymptote what about our example none in our example none why right because it's continuous whenever a function is continuous it cannot satisfy this property at any point do you agree okay since our function is continuous on R on the entire real line so vertical asymptotes can only show up at points of discontinuity and what kind of discontinuity essential. essential discontinuity do you agree so these would actually the the first clues of these occurring would actually show up at the very beginning when you study continuity of f okay good okay so that's vertical asymptotes and we don't have any of those um, definition so what I want to define now is an asymptote which is of the form y equals a x plus b a linear asymptote okay and have you seen those before or did you only do horizontal asymptotes in the past you did both yeah. okay and is that what you called them oblique, oblique. okay so let's write the definition and then I'll show you um, where it stems from so y equals a x plus b is an asymptote oblique or linear if if what so let's maybe draw the picture first so here's our coordinate system and here's some line of the form y equals ax plus b and we want the function to approach that line where right at infinity or at minus infinity so we want to somehow encode a phenomena like this here's f and we wanted to do something like this to approach this line as x goes 
to infinity. Clear? So the blue is f, the black is y equals ax plus b. Okay, so how do we say this formally? How do we say that the function approaches this line? The limit, good start, if the limit, what limit as x goes to what? Okay, again we can write it plus or minus infinity. Of what? Okay, if you want to write f of x equals, what are you going to write after the equals? But x just went to infinity. You can't take x to infinity and still have x's after the limit, right? That doesn't make sense. You can't write the limit of f of x as x goes to infinity equals, that has to be a number, right? It can't, the limit cannot be ax plus b. Do you agree? Do you see that there's uh, something that doesn't compile there? So how do you resolve that? No, 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 almost. Minus was a good start. F of x minus minus ax plus b equals zero. That's the definition. Okay. Okay, now how do we find let's leave the formula for f up here on the board. We may need it later. So this was our f. How do we find finding um, um, linear asymptotes? finding y equals ax plus b, this oblique asymptote. Well, so let, maybe, maybe I'll give you uh, a clue to why I write this. So if um, f of x minus ax minus b goes to zero as x goes to infinity, that's what we're assuming, right? If this happens, then, if I divide it by x, if I divide it by x, I'm going to get this over x, this over x, and this over x. And what's the limit of this going to be as x goes to infinity? If I take something that goes to zero, and divided by x, and x goes to infinity, what's the limit going to be? Still going to be zero. Do you agree? Do you agree? So this is going to be true. And this thing, maybe I'll change color. Do you agree that if this holds, then this holds? Do you agree that this goes to zero when x goes to infinity in any case. When x goes to infinity, no matter what b is, b over x goes to zero. Right? Say yes. yes. This is just a constant a, because it's ax over x. So in order for this to go to zero, f of x over x minus a has to go to zero. In other words, f of x over x has to approach a. Do you agree? So, the conclusion is, if this thing is going to be an asymptote, then a is going to be the limit of f of x over x, as x goes to plus or minus infinity. And then, once you have a, b is going to be the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of f of x minus a x. Good? So that's how you find 
that's how you find linear asymptotes or oblique asymptotes. And in our case, so this, this was a theoretical discussion. Let's go back to our case. And I'm going to leave the calculations for you to do. I'm just going to write it in our case. This is f. You have to do this. Divide it by x. Find the limit. That's going to be a. Then plug it into here. Find the limit. That's going to be b. In our case, y equals minus x plus 1. So the a turns out to be negative 1 and the b turns out to be 1. Uh, is an asymptote. at both sides, both at minus infinity and infinity. Yes, yes, you could have one asymptote at infinity and a different asymptote at negative infinity or, or, or not to have an asymptote at one side. Yes. I don't know off the top of my head to give you an example of a function that has uh, different oblique asymptotes at both ends. You can, it's of course very easy to do if you just take a, a piecewise function, right? You can, but, but if you want a, for, a formula that's not piecewise for then, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's easy and I'm just, okay. So the final, the final step which was what? This was step 10, right? Asymptotes was step 10. So once you do that, the final step is drawing the graph. That's all the information we can extract about the function, other than plugging in a million points. The more points you plug in would make it more accurate. But for us, this is going to be sufficient. So step 11 graph. And I'm going to leave this temporary drawing here so we can see how close we actually were and let's make, but it's stuck in the middle. Um, oh well. Um, let's draw it here. Horizontal asymptotes are inside the, the linear ones, right? Right. Whenever, whenever the A, whenever the A is zero, then it's just of the form y equals b, which is a horizontal asymptote. So if your a, if the limit f of x over x is zero, then what you found is a, a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so just a particular case of of um, of an oblique asymptote. Okay. Okay, so let's draw the actual graph or our most precise sketch for the actual graph in our case. So there's this y equals minus x plus 1. So it's going to have a slope of negative 1 and it's going to cross it 1. So it's going to look something like this. Something like this. Well, drawing straight lines is a challenge. Unless you have a ruler, which I don't. This looks straight, straight enough. Okay, so this is our asymptote. This is y equals minus x plus 1. And we know that it's an asymptote both at infinity and at negative infinity. Now, we know that there's this point 0. Okay, so let's maybe plot some numbers as well. So this is 1 on the x-axis. This is 0, 1, 2, Three. Those were the significant numbers in our in our picture. Okay, so we have this point zero zero. We know this point, and we had the point at zero three, where we intercepted the graph. And then there was this point two. Uh, what was it? Cube root of four. It's not on the board anymore. Yeah. So it's somewhere cube root of 4, it will be somewhere here, right? 
Good? And if you want to be, if you want to be on the safe side, just plug in five more values just to, to see what's going on. It's not really necessary, but you could. Now, we know that y equals minus x plus 1 is an asymptote at negative infinity. We know that the function is decreasing, so it's somehow going to approach this asymptote. Can it cross it? Can it approach it from the, from the top, or can it approach it? Not in this example. Why? In general, it could. That's true. But why not in this example? Right. Because in order to cross it, and then to approach it again, it would have to have more points of inflection. It would have to change. Do you see that? So in order to do it concavely, remember we had that it's concave here. Let's look again here. It's concave here. It has to... Look, look here a second. Just for a second. In order to be concave in this zone, it has to always look like this. Always. It cannot approach the line once it crosses it, because then it would, in order to approach it, it would have to concave up. It would have to be convex. Okay? So we know that the picture here is really, really something like this. And it approaches the asymptote like this. Do you agree? From below. It has no choice. Because we know that it, there are no further points of inflection here. Okay? Because once it crosses it from above, if you want it to go back down, and not to cross it again, but to approach it, look at me. If you want it to come back down, well, it's the other side. If you want it to come back down and then approach it, you're going to have a point of inflection. Well, it's hard to argue when you're doing things like that and I'm doing things like that, but either I convince you or come up during the break and I'll convince you further on the board. Okay? So, what I claim is, since there are no further points of inflection here, in order to be concave, approach this line, Without any further points of inflection, it has to just approach it from below. Okay? The next data we already know, we know that it's again concave here, so it's going to look something like this. Something like this. With the max value at, at 2. This is the maximum. And then here, for the exact same argument, it's going to approach the asymptote from above. Okay? So the picture is going to be... Well, this 3 is in my way, but never mind. The picture is going to be something like this. And that's the, the, the most accurate sketch that I can draw, I can make it slightly more accurate again if I take the value at 4 and take the value at 5 and take the value at minus 1 and minus 2 maybe. That would probably make it slightly more accurate. But you can see that we already had most of the information here. We, we had quite a bit of it, at least in this example. Okay? Questions? Um, at 3, okay, what happened at 3? Let's recall. So at 3 we found that the first derivative doesn't exist. Okay? So saying that the first derivative doesn't exist is saying that either it's a cusp, which is clearly what's going on here, or, or it could be that the first derivative is, I'm, I'm putting it in quote, in quote marks, infinity. So it just passes through it with an infinite slope, and that's the situation here. In order to formally see that, you have to calculate the derivative by definition at x equals 3. And you're going to get that the limit that defines the derivative there is minus infinity. That's why the derivative is not defined, because in order to be defined, it has to be a finite number. 
But that's the interpretation of saying that the limit is minus infinity. It just goes like this. Just like the function cub cubic root of x itself, which is not differentiable at zero, because it, the picture is something like this. The, the slope at zero is infinite. Okay, it's the inverse function of x cubed, where the slope at zero was zero, right? So here the slope at zero, this is cubic root of x, okay? So that's what's going on there, and in order to formalize it, you have to do the, the to calculate the limit defining the derivative at x equals three, and see that the limit is, well, minus infinity in this case. Good? Good question. Good, everybody? Hello. Questions? Okay. So this wraps up this example. This wraps up this example. And once again, I only did an example indicating all the steps, but it, it hides the entire theory. So if you get a different example, you just trace those steps. And the challenges may be different in different examples. So here we had no issues and no, nothing interesting happened in terms of continuity, for example. In different examples, there could be. Okay, in this case, the, the second derivative was kind of interesting. In different examples, it could be not. Okay, so it's important to, to practice, of course, and to do some of these to get familiar and comfortable with, with doing them. Okay. Okay, so in the remaining few minutes, I want to do an introduction to the topic that we're going to study um, next time. A quick introduction. And that introduction is Taylor's polynomial, or Taylor's theorem, not or, and. So let's put a title, Intro to Taylor. Okay, so we've been discussing the derivative quite extensively. And we saw that it has, that it is meaningful, right? That some information about the function is hidden there and we've been using it. We've been using it to do L'Hopital's rule, for example, right? So now we want to go back to the origins of this definition of the derivative. What was the derivative? What was the geometric meaning of the derivative initially? It was the slope of the tangent line. Remember? And when you take a function, let's take a function, let's call it f. Functions are blue. So let's take a function. Here's a function, f. And it has a tangent line, let's say it's zero. So here's the, the point zero, and here's the tangent line here. There it is, right? And what is this line? So the, the tangent to f at x equals zero is what? It, it, it's a line, it's y equals ax plus b, right? The slope is going to be what? F prime, f prime at zero, right? The slope of the tangent line at a point is the derivative at that point. And it's going to have to cross the y-axis, that's the b, at which point? F of zero. Does everybody agree that this is the tangent to f at x equals zero, right? Now look at this picture. I didn't draw any special f here, just drew an f, drew the tangent line. Do you see that this tangent line 
kind of seems to coincide with the graph of f near zero. Do you see that? It's pretty close. Once you go far away, once you go far away from zero, that's no longer the case. Here, f is all the way down here, and the tangent line is here. So when you go far away from zero, they're no longer, there's no relevance. But near zero, I mean, even from where I stand, the, the black and the blue kind of look the same. Do you see that? Okay. So the, 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 the statement here, the imprecise statement here, is that in some sense, this tangent line approximates the function near the point. Okay. What do I mean by approximate? If I want to do some calculation with f, any calculation with f, if I'm willing to have some error, not to be accurate, if it's not critical for me to be very accurate, I can use the tangent line instead and get pretty close results as long as I'm close to the tangent point, right? And that's the idea that the Taylor polynomials try to take a step further. So let's write it. It is an approximation, double P? Approximation of F in some sense, which we will make formal next time, near x equals 0. Okay. For example, let's make it one step more formal in the sense that, so if you look for, for example at, let, let's call this y of x. This is the, the tangent line. It's a function, y of x. Saying that it's a good approximation is saying that they're close. So I want to say, what is the difference between f of x itself and y of x? The function and the proposed approximation, the tangent line. What is this difference? Well, it's f of x minus this thing, right? Minus f prime 0 x plus or minus, so this will be a minus 2, minus f at 0. Do you agree to this? Yep. As x approaches 0, as we get closer and closer to this tangent point, to 0, what happens to this? As x approaches 0, this term goes to 0, right? It's a constant times something that goes to zero. Do you see that? What about f of x? This doesn't go to zero. It goes to f of zero. As x goes to zero, f of x goes to f of zero. Why is that true? Right, because f is differentiable at that point. Otherwise, we couldn't discuss the derivative. And that implies that it's continuous at that point. Therefore, as x goes to zero, f of x goes to f of 0. Do you agree? So this goes to f of 0. If we subtract f of 0, we get 0. So for example, in this sense, when we get closer and closer to 0, the difference between the function at, and the tangent, the approximation, becomes smaller and smaller. They get closer and closer. And they actually coincide at x equals 0. Do you agree? Okay, so this is the idea that we're going to want to generalize, and we'll do that next time, to more sophisticated approximations, which are not going to be just linear functions. They're actually going to be polynomials, and they're going to be called the Taylor polynomials. Okay, so let's stop here for today.